Hey, welcome to the latest edition of Jetpacks to the Bank from True Philadelphia and Sports Care. I am Joe Boric, of course, joined here by my host, Andrew Santangelo, looking fly in his Phillies jersey. How are you doing, Andrew? <laughs> I'm doing very well. Classes are done. Got a, got a nice little break here before the fall semester kicks in, so enjoy that. And, uh, of course, baseball starts tonight. Yankees, uh, Nationals, Dodgers, Giants. And then, of course, our beloved Philadelphia Phillies. A little over 24 hours away still, but we are a day, day away uh, nonetheless. And I'm excited to, to watch Aaron Nola kick off the season tomorrow night and what should be a, a series win. Um, but who knows? Because, you know, the Marlins always like to beat us. That's a, <laughs> that's a, uh, that's a very solid uh, point. But, but, you know, hopefully we prevail and our better team prevails and we don't have what happened last year happen but yeah you pointed out with the not the Marlins with the Nationals starting the season off tonight they are unfortunately not going to have Juan Soto who tested positive today and from an article I read earlier it said in order to come back somebody must test negative twice in at least 24 hours show no symptoms for 72 hours and receive receive approval from team doctors. That's apparently what uh, the one article. So he's going to be out for at least, I would say, yeah. this entire series and maybe probably part of the next series. He'll be out for probably about a week. And yeah, this, would, this is where it becomes interesting. Yeah, the Phillies play the Nationals on Monday night, I believe. Uh, you had, obviously, him go back with his team. They played Baltimore Tuesday. He's been practicing with the team. And it took him 48, 48 hours to get this test. So I already have a couple questions. First off, they're supposed to get the test results back pretty quickly. But instead, it took his 48 hours. So I'm a little confused on why it took so long. And now you have him still with all those guys. And who knows um, who he interacted with on the team? Who knows who else has it? And hopefully nobody on the Phillies has it because we just played them. So mm-hmm. I am concerned. And this this is why it's going to be tough to get it done uh, without being in a bubble because these guys are going to be traveling. You're, you're, you're going to get it. He's not going to be the only one. I honestly wouldn't be surprised to have one close to one a day almost, honestly, with the way they're going to be traveling every day and stuff. So this is only the beginning for it. Hopefully they find a way to, to get this thing situated because, I mean, again, who knows who else on the Nationals have it, and then they're about to play a, a three-game series, with, if not four. I don't, I don't know if they have a tomorrow I did off. I feed those since but, we started camp because uh, Steele asked me to look it up for him. Um, the percentile of positive tests now probably went up a little bit because Hunter Dozier and Soto tested positive, but was under 2% amongst like the thousands of tests um, given recently. So – that that seemed decent, but also we're not traveling right now, really. We're doing camps and all that. So your point of traveling is the biggest point because once you start really doing that, that's what's going to remain to be seen because, yes, they're traveling in Korea, but in Korea, I don't know if everybody knows, I think they have, what, 10 teams? So yeah, the, I think it's only 10 teams, yeah, and all their stadiums yeah. are pretty close to each and other. Yeah, there's the area. I, I think, I think their 10 teams close. are pretty much like us, the Nationals. Like, I, I don't think they travel that far. No, they're like, not. I, I, I think the one day, they're so close that one of the – like they're, they're so close that every single game got rained out because they all basically got the mm-hmm. same weather. Yeah, the only game <laughs> that didn't get funny. rained out was the game for some reason, probably because it was on in the States. They tried to play it. Um they played the first couple innings of the game that was on in the States, yeah. and then they couldn't get it in because it was pouring too much. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, we can now, instead of talking about Korean baseball, um, go, KBO, and- go Dinos. Not a, a Korean baseball uh, podcast. So uh, we'll move into the Phillies and their roster announcement, who, by the way, for the Gooses or Looses fans like myself, um, Phil Gosson will be with the team tomorrow, and just because he was a non-roster inventee, apparently they had to do some things, and then he's going to be on the team tomorrow, and he's going to kill it like he did last year as a pinch hitter, and he's fast. So again, this year, that's an added bonus if you're fast, which I love Neil Walker and his switch hitting power, but he's not fast. So an added bonus for Phil is he's fast in the extra innings this year. Uh, because if Roman Quinn stays healthy and he's starting, obviously you can't pinch run Roman Quinn in extra innings. So uh, that'll be helpful for him. 
But Andrew, who's a surprise if you have any? Let's start with, I guess it's not a positive, but a little bit of a better thing. Who's a surprise for you that might have not made it from the jump um, rather than a guy that made it first? Uh, there's a lot of guys. There's honestly a lot of players on this list that I'm very surprised to see make this team. Um, you mentioned one of them already. That's Phil Goslin. Uh, I'm I'm surprised he made the team. Um, Kyler Garlic he killed surprised. it in camp. Why are you surprised Phil made it? Phil killed it in summer camp. I mean, we all thought Josh Harrison, Logan Forsythe, and uh, Therese were all. Well, yeah, but didn't we him. know that Phil would make it when Josh Harrison asked for a release? I mean, I guess, but I'm still surprised he made it because, I mean, yeah, if you're going to go off what we woke up to today, I guess I'm not surprised he made it. But well, I'm just talking about overall oh, gotcha. from the restart. Um, I'm very, I'm surprised he made it. I thought Josh Harrison would have been there with Neil Walker. Uh, two guys, I believe, played together in Pittsburgh. Um, so, I, I mean, he already had some, some mm-hmm. good stuff going there. So, but, I mean, it is what it is. We can get into those guys later. Um, and then, honestly... <laughs> What do you start with this bullpen? I mean, oh yeah, because at I least mean, Austin has power. Like at least he's a guy that might do well. Uh, I know Alex Carr tweeted about him. He has some pop. He was just buried in the Dodgers system. But yeah, bullpen. <laughs> I, I, I got. I'm not. I don't know these guys, so I don't. I got nothing against them. But your bullpen is Austin Davis. Um, your bull, uh, Austin you Davis. I'm surprised he made it. Trevor Again, Kelly. I'm surprised he made it. Cole Irvin, surprised he made it. Uh, Ramon Rosso, surprised he made it. I'm not surprised he made it. He's a guy that, remember, Shane talked about it on our other podcast. He has been owning it all of camp and has nasty stuff. Again, if you wake up today, maybe. But when you're saying he beat out guys like Drew Storen, Bud Norris. Well, Drew Storen uh, at least a while ago, though. Yeah, but he came back like – I, okay, so I guess I guess we're taking two different approaches to this. You're, it seems like you're taking it by what you woke up to today. I've taken it by what we started with in camp. Well, I understand that, but even going from that, uh, Bud Norris pitched like crap. Ramon Russo pitched well. Robert Stock has great pitches but has no control. Um, he actually got DFA'd. Um, and then so you have like a lot of issues with control where – I think Russo showed he was able to control the strike zone and has nasty stuff. He might be like that Victor Arano 2018 guy that comes in and surprises you and pitches really well, kind of like Arano did in 2018. So I'm not – that's more why I'm not overly surprised he made it. He kind of reminds well, me of the guy. No, that I'm surprised him because, that. again, you just mentioned a guy, Arano. I would have thought he would have made it over him. I would have thought Francisco Liriano would have made it over him. Yeah, it's also I would have thought problems. Robert Stock made it over him. Like – and I mean, I'm not just saying necessarily maybe that guy, but I'm talking about overall all these relievers. I would have been, I would have been less shocked if some of those other guys would have made it over him. So I'm not saying him compared to Cole Irvin. I'm just saying him compared to everyone that got cut. I'm surprised he made it. Is no, what I, I'm trying to say. I, 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 I know it's I just it's bolstered, it's, it's bolstered by missing a lot of guys already. I mean, you're missing Sir Anthony Dominguez, you're missing uh, David Robertson, you're missing um, uh, Ranger Suarez. I think that. Yeah. Might be it, but, yeah. Because uh, Hector Neris made it and Tommy Hunter made it. There were two question marks. We didn't know if they'd make it or not to That's start the year. Um, so they are bolstered by that, and it'll be inter- interesting to see who is the first to get cut when those two guys or those three guys can't count. Those three guys come back. Um, I mean, I'm Ranger Suarez is a lefty, so you figure he's going to take Davis That's and Cole take. Irvin spot. Cole, 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 um, Cole. I guess we'll see whoever gets <laughs> off to a faster start. Um, and then you're going to get, again, you get uh, some other guys back. So it's, it's, this roster took me by surprise and I knew the bullpen was bad, but I mean, th- this is, th- this is what could kick you out of the playoffs right here. I mean, th- this bullpen is going to be very questionable and who knows what you're going to get out of it. Yeah. I mean, I just think Russo, he pitched really well. I wasn't surprised he made it because that's the guy that when Shane asked me about him, he pitched so well in spring. I actually probably would have been surprised because our bullpen sucks. Um, like, really isn't that good, honestly. No, uh, and, if, and again, if, he, if he he, I'm not saying it. he didn't pitch well. He pitched very well. Yeah. I'm just Where saying Arano compared to some guys that got cut. Well, that's the problem. Like, it, but, like, the problem is if Swarza came in and pitched well, 
and had like his stuff where it looked like he was reestablishing himself, he would have made the team. The same would have happened with Norris. The same would have happened with, well, Storin was more of a risk thing because he didn't pitch in a long time. But um, the same would have potentially happened with him. They just came in and showed they don't have much left in the tank. So then it kind of be, became the case of, they kind of talked about it on the telecast, they're probably just going to go with the young guys and hope the young guns or the guys that don't have the bullets, like Reggie McClan, who has great stuff, are able to like find the strike zone with Brian Price and Joe Girardi and our bullpen coaches because they have great stuff and be able to figure it out there. Now, in terms of lefties, how you brought up Ranger Suarez, he's a guy that I think is going to be huge again this year in our bullpen because he can go a couple innings for you as well as a lefty. And I think that's why he'll probably take Cole Irvin out because Cole Irvin can kind of also do that. If Austin Davis is actually pitching decent, Austin Davis has a good slider. So it's not like like he actually has like Austin Davis when he actually pitches well in the minors, when you look at him, has a great out pitch. Cole Irvin yeah. literally is just a strike thrower that just like if, if he's if he's not able to hit the inner parts of the zone or right dotting the outer corners, he's not effective at all because he doesn't throw that fast. And he's just a strike. He's just a strike thrower where Davis actually has a decent out pitch. So I would think uh, Cole Irvin will be gone by the time a uh, Ranger comes back. And then Trevor Kelly, by the time someone else, who, who's a uh, wait, who's our other injured pitcher to start the season? Start the oh, season. Ro- You're missing. Oh, if Robertson comes back, Trevor Kelly. I mean, yeah, sure anything's done for the year. Yeah. Um, if Robertson comes back, there's no chance Trevor. But Kelly here's another curveball, not an injury guy, but a um, service year guy. I think we're all expecting in six days or so. I think you're going to see Spencer Howard. Now the question is, who gets removed from him? Do they go? If say Zach Eflin, Vince Velasquez, or Nick Pavetta start the first week terrible. Do you kick one of them out? I mean, because here's my thing. I, I'm skeptical about moving Howard to the bullpen. He's a starter. You want him to get his feet wet in the, in the MLB. I, I'm a little skeptical about moving to the bullpen. I, I really am. Yeah. Um, I know that's the big talk because Vince has looked good in spring training. You have um, – Vince is our three. Yeah, Vince is three. Yeah. Uh, and that's that, – that says it all right there. Yeah. Um, but, but I, I agree with you. I, I so, think I think he's going to be in the rotation when he gets called up. So I, I mean, good. that's the question, though. I guess you're going to kick Vince out, though. Like no, 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 no. I don't think Zach Eflin's going to be ready. So by default, I think uh, Pavetta will end up pitching one game, and then if he just looks decent, they would well, still say, Howard. The say shot. Pavetta goes out there and the gives way, seven, yeah. seven, seven innings, one long. run against the yeah. Yankees. What do you do? Well, if Pavetta goes off, that's the only way Howard's not going right into the rotation. If, if Pavetta- I, I, let me give you a scenario. Let me give you, let me give you a scenario. Vince Velasquez on Sunday goes four innings. Er, no, we'll go five innings, gives up three runs. Pavetta takes a spot for Eflin. Pavetta goes six innings, gives up four runs. What are you doing? Are you keeping them in the rotation for another start? Because you got to remember, there's a big difference between the Marlins and the Yankees offense. Pavetta's going six, giving up four against the Yankees. Yeah, I would say that's Pavetta not that's not horrible. Pavetta. Yeah, Vince can only go five against the Marlins, while three runs isn't horrible. Five runs against well, or five innings. That's where you get a little. So what do you what do you do in that situation? Do you? I mean, because it's also tough to judge a guy off of one start, especially mm-hmm. when it's his beginning of the year start, because everyone's yeah. still getting their feet under underneath them in the season. So and that's why it's such a difficult situation. And if it was a normal year, what the service year goes to the beginning of May, right? So you have plenty of time yeah. to see who who's kind of in rhythm, who's still figuring things out, and it's not well, as big of a personally, decision. but personally, I mean, again, six days—that's one star for each of those guys. You don't. Everyone's got a bad start here and there. Like that's true. Yeah, personally, I think uh, when Spence comes up, I think that's the only reason Trevor Kelly made the team. Personally, it's like, yeah, Trevor Kelly's here for six days. Um, he'll be here, uh, can sit in the bullpen, enjoy his life for six days because uh, but he's a the- guy that can go a couple innings for you as a reliever. And if you move Pavetta, I don't think Spence would go to the bullpen. Like I said, but if you move Pavetta or Vince. Your likelihood is that you would hope because as starters, both, um, especially Pavetta when he's on, has been able to go deep into games and still have velo. Vince has been able to have it for like three innings until he showed it in spring this year. 
So um, that you would hope they would be able to go a couple innings. Having a poor man's version of Nick Vinson would make absolutely no sense in your bullpen at that point. So I think <laughs> so, Trevor Kelly would be sent down. So what about though if Eflin's fine? Now that that oh, there's a whole nother curve. If Eflin's but fine, I will say this: I, I think Kelly stays on the team. Uh, I think when you bring up Howard or when you bring back Suarez, which everyone comes back first. Actually, I don't even think Suarez is reported, so I, I don't think we can rely on him anytime soon. Back for a while, to yeah. be honest, but even when Howard comes up. I think you're kicking out Cole Irvin or um, Austin Davis. Well, then I, mean, I would say it's probably Cole Irvin because he's that's uh, four lefties. So yeah. I'm a little. Although, here's the thing: you get 30 players, and that's that's the other funny part about this. In two weeks, we're going to be talking about you got to cut two guys anyway, mm-hmm. and, and and you figure. Uh, you're, oh yeah, but Cole Irvin pitched to a two or not Cole Irvin. So Jeez, God, you probably have Trevor Kelly. Uh, Austin Davis pitched to a 270 in camp, though. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, I, I took down. Yeah, but it's, come on, it's camp. I, I understand get, that. By the time he gets but, in there, he's but everybody. By the time he gets off, in there, he's wait facing a minute, the wait a Goslins and Everybody's the going off about the whole. Uh, but I'm talking about in the spring games, too. He pitched to a 270. Like, everyone's going off about how Velasquez has looked. And then I put a poll out which I'll bring this up now, by the way, just to get it out there. It had the same percentage for he's going to do decent to no, this is all just like a wash thing right now, basically. Um, so um, that's the, that's the, uh, pr- that's basically what it was. I'll try well, to- while you get the poll up, here's my thing. And, and I've said it before. I- I'm skeptical still. Video only does me so much. I've seen preseason games of Ben Simmons shooting threes. I've seen videos of him shooting threes at practice. I've seen Vince Velasquez the last three years dominate spring training, dominate the first game or two in the regular season, and then he blows up. I've seen it all before. You've seen it all before. So I am not ready to say they are for real this year. I need to see it translate into real games. So I, I, I have to, I mean, trust me, I hope they pan out, but. We've we've done it before. We've been tricked these last three years. If you really think about it, if you go back these last two years, especially these teams have fooled us. Like we were in first place at the deadline the last two years, and then we fall to fourth place by the end of the year. You're right, that's, but the difference is in first place at the deadline. That's a championship of the uh, division this year. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in uh, in uh, in that but, same game, too. But here's the thing. I think I brought this up to you. But no, I was, well, me- I was, me- I was messing around. <laughs> no, no, but that's a lot of people's <laughs> argument is, well, sixty games is this. We're we're good for sixty games. My counter to that, and here's why I'm skeptical about it. It might be the beginning of the year, but your second half is your second half, and we're basically playing second half baseball. Yeah, we do you're, have a second half manager though. You're not Compared starting in April. You're starting in July, end of July. So to me. You got to be skeptical with how much we put into, oh, this guy gets off the fast start because it's not necessarily just a start. If he struggles in the month of July and August, it's still July and August. Like, it's not like, oh, well, we're starting the season late, so we're, we're going to switch the months around and uh, we're, we're starting in April. No, well, that's not how it works. Like, these months are still the months, yeah. and, if, and maybe it's fatigue, but maybe it's also the weather. Maybe the heat, they're not better in the heat. They're better in the colder weather. So now if you're playing just in the heat until you get to those colder months, maybe that's part of the issue. So I'm really interested to see. I'm not trying to get too caught up with, oh, this guy gets off to a great start. He gets off to a slow start. I'm really just trying to take this season as this. No one's no one's ever experienced it before. We got to stay open-minded in terms of what kind of start this guy's going to get to. And it, I'm ready. It's going to be fun. I, I'm excited. I know you are. I mean, yeah. me and you are basically the same person. We're tired yeah. of watching whatever TV sure. show or whatever movie. We're ready to watch sports. Uh, I can guarantee you I will be no- doing nothing else this weekend except having MLB TV uh, up. And um, well, I'll have the Union on Saturday night as well um, in their first game around the 16. So it's going to be fun. Yeah. But it was uh, no sir at 43% and or he's going to be decent. At forty three percent for Vin and the, Diesel. The question was, do you buy the hype? Uh, so who thinks it's the real deal this year? Is Velasquez going to take off for the Phillies in twenty twenty? He that was the I, question. I, to answer the question, I'd have to go no, sir, because I'm not buying the hype. Uh, but I would say 
by saying no, sir, I'm not saying he's going to be a terrible pitcher. I'm just saying you don't know what you're getting until he gets out there and does it. Yeah, I, I would say he's Like uh, Biscuit kind of was saying on our other podcast, Vinny Velo, if he can kind of get it going, maybe with Girardi and uh, Brian Price, he'll be able to kind of establish himself as a five and a third to six innings pitch per start guy, which will be good enough if you only give up two to three runs or against good lineups like the Yankees, four runs per start, but pitch really well and strike out a bunch of guys and look good and make Aaron Judge look like an idiot. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, um, all those good things, um, then we would be fine. But if he comes into the bullpen and looks really good, that's where I think he could flourish. But I also am still pulling for him a bit as a starter like Biscuit is, because obviously all pitchers want to be starters. That hey, they're on so- our team. I'm pulling for everybody. So, um, but, um, but I can, I think he might do best as a bullpen guy and could even become a back half guy at a certain point because, of his ability to throw that cutter now, especially too. adding that makes me even think better of him as a reliever down the line. If he doesn't pan as a starter, getting that in on lefties and doing all that good stuff in the bullpen, that makes me more confident in him as a reliever. If it doesn't pan out in the rotation. Yeah, no, I mean, we talked about before with his stuff, he adds the cutter. He didn't have that last year. So maybe that extra pitch will go a long way for him and avoiding that bullpen role. And again, I, I listen, I might be critical at times, and we all know that at this point. But here, I, I would be the first person to say, I hope they prove me wrong. I might be critical, but uh, it doesn't mean I want them to do bad. I want to see these guys do well. I want to hoist that. I want this team to hoist that World Series trophy at the end of the year. I mean, I, 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 there's nothing more I would want them to be wrong in this situation. And and uh, again, I hope I am wrong. And in the sense of where I think this team's going to go. I I don't think we've said what we thought before, so I'll throw out my prediction here. I don't see this. The, the over-under for this team is 31.5. I, I took the under and will continue to take the under because of the pitching staff. I really think this team's about a 500-ball club, and I think they go 30-30 and 30 on the year. Um, before, I thought that I was going to miss the playoffs. I don't know everybody's record, but I, I think the Phillies are a top-eight team in NL now with this they just announced, um, if you haven't seen it, the expanded playoffs. So yep. I, the Phillies should be the Phillies should be in the top eight. Obviously, you have the Dodgers; they're going to be a lock for the one. You have you'll have the NL Central winner, who, which is up for grabs, and, the, and then the yeah, NL East really winner, which grabs. is also up for grabs. Also up for grabs. So outside of the Dodgers, the, to, to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I, I'm confident in saying I really think the Dodgers are the only National League team that you can say are a lock for the playoffs? Um, maybe a lock for the eh, – I'm trying to think because, of another team that I would Because if, if you think about it, you're looking at eight teams. Obviously, you throw the Dodgers up there, so that's seven right now. Right, right. Now, couldn't you see the Phillies winning the division? Couldn't you see the Braves winning the division? And couldn't you see the Nationals winning the division? Um, yeah. So yeah, the that's, Nationals, the Nationals that's, are hurt. That's three teams right there, just in your division. So obviously you'll give one. And we're we're gonna play we're gonna play harder to get into the playoffs. So let's give the division to the Braves. They won it last year. So now you got your two. And then wouldn't you say you could see the Reds, the Cubs, the Brewers, or the um Cardinals. the Cardinals winning their division? The Central's the one that's the most up for grabs. By four, because that's four people that could win that division. Well, I also think the Mets could win the division if they're healthy and everything goes right. So, so I really think it's four and four there. So let's give it. Who do you want to give the division to in the Central? Uh, who's your pick? The Cubs don't have the pitching anymore because they get they don't stay healthy. Um, I would. Damn, that's a tough. That's the toughest division to pick, honestly. I I would say because of the fact that they have the guy that just knows how to carry their team if he's healthy, um, and if their pitching steps up, um, I'll just go with Milwaukee because I think uh, they have the MVP guy. Yelich has carried that team, obviously, for spurts, and then they piggybacked off of that momentum last year. So, so uh, they also have a very solid bullpen. Um, 
with so, Hayden and Knebel and Hauser and all those guys. So, so we're giving it to the Dodgers, Brewers, Braves. So now you got five spots left. You got the Phillies, and, and tell me if you think I'm wrong. But this is contending for those five spots: the Phillies, the Mets, the Nationals, Reds, Cardinals, Cubs. Uh, Brewers got the division. And then Diamondbacks, Padres. Uh, I think they could get a wild card. So you're yeah. going to have one, two, three, four, five. You're going to have eight it's gonna teams. It's going to be fun in a 60 game. No, because you're gonna, 60 games. You're going to have eight teams legitimately fighting for. Uh, wait, is that right? That's not right. Yeah, I guess they are going. They're, I didn't put that together. So they're going eight teams on each side. So that's five wild card teams, essentially. That's crazy. Um, so yeah, basically you got you got eight teams fighting for five wild card spots. That's I mean, that, again, that's pretty crazy. And like you said, the East and the the East and the Central are for grabs. So you swing any one of those teams. Say the Phillies replace the Braves. Now the Braves are fighting for the life. That's why I really think the Dodgers are the only lock for the playoffs. And I think that's I mean you don't get many years like that. And what's crazy, even if it was a normal year, I think you could say the same thing, and you just have. Those eight teams fighting for two wild card spots. No, the NL, yeah, the NL uh, did become very log jammed because of the um, talent overall and the difference of the NL East has a lot more pitching combined with hitting, where the uh, Central has, other than a couple teams, just bigger lineups combined with guys that looked really good last year and you have to, you hope they continue to look good pitching wise. So I, I guess I would say not as proven commodities is probably the way to put that. Um, so that's, uh, but th- it's very um, interesting in this 60 game stretch because anybody can really get hot. Um, well, not anybody, but most teams can get hot. Uh, I don't think the Marlins are going to win. Uh, I'll but, tell you what, uh, I'm not predict. Obviously I will never say the Marlins are going to the playoffs. But their roster is actually – like, they, they built a lineup that's actually not as bad as it was last year. Mm-mm, like, no. we can sit back and we laugh at Baltimore. Don't they have Jesus Aguilar now, too? Yeah, I think so. And Corey, and they signed Corey Dickerson. Um, we can sit back and we laugh at Baltimore. We laugh at Detroit. We laugh at uh, Kansas City's lineup at this point. Um, but honestly, the Marlins have a lineup. And obviously, we all know what they did to us last year. Oh, they got Jonathan Valor. Damn it, that's a really good player. He might. Yeah, they up. got Jonathan. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> obviously Jorge Jorge Alfaro. If you, if you make a mistake pitch to him, yeah, he can he can give it a ride. Um, Brian Anderson's never been. I mean, as he the best, no, but he's always been a respectable name. And he's um, a guy you think is eventually going to have a really good year because he was a talent, high talented prospect, and then has just been floating around being a good third baseman for all. Yeah. So, again, I don't think this team gets anywhere near the playoffs. What I'm trying to say, though, is that you can't sit back and take them as lightly as we could. Well, Phillies could well, but as, Phillies definitely. Yeah, yeah. as much as some teams could have these past few years. Because I think, again, not a good lineup, but it's a lineup that you have to show somewhat respect to. It's not like when we go up against Baltimore, it's like, okay, we should get three games out of here, if not minimum two. Like, this Marlins team, like, and I don't remember what they all got in the staff. I know their opening day starter in uh, San Diego Alcantara, he's not he's not a bad pitcher. So, I know, I think they also have Caleb Smith. He's not a terrible pitcher either. No, he's, he's pretty good. Um, so, honestly, they, again, not, not, not saying anywhere near playoffs, but it's a team you got to do show some respect to that I think can get a little over, the, close to 20 to 22 wins. Uh, maybe I don't know. I forget what their exact over under is, but like we make jokes again. Baltimore, like, are they even going to hit twenty wins? Are they even like people are making the jokes? Only, yeah. what, people are making jokes. What's going to happen? More Pete Alonso home runs or more Baltimore wins? Like you can't <laughs> do that with this Miami team. I think. No, no, Miami at least has uh, other guys. The only guy that because now that Mancini's out, um, unfortunately, um, recovering from his own battle. With cancer, um, Austin Hayes is a guy that hit really well as a prospect outfielder when he came up, coming up in his mid twenties, um, at the age of twenty five, and he's a good contact bat to ball hitter fielder. But 
you're not going to a bull yard. Um, well, no one's going to a bull yard this year, but if you <laughs> were, uh, you're not going to watch and you're not putting on your TV to um, watch Austin Hayes, per se. Uh, but he's a good little player on Baltimore and also a little player that's probably not a bad guy to pick up potentially for your fantasy team since he can hit above 270 and be one of those guys that actually drives people in if anyone gets on damn bases in front of them. Um, but if that, as long as that happens, um, they do have Hanzo Alberto, who actually is one of the best contact rate hitters in all of baseball for those people that love that uh, nice, sexy stat um, from the uh, <laughs> analytics people. So uh, he never really strikes out much. So at least you got two guys that don't strike out much. So there you go, Baltimore. Because you had Chris Davis, who's just like, oh, 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 strike out, strike out, strike out. So, you know, got Chris Davis, who's probably going to go for a lot of strikeouts, which is unfortunate because I saw that guy watching going to Baltimore with the LaSalle father-son stuff in his peak and watching him when he had that sweet swing uh, crushing baseballs was some sight to see. And I don't know what the hell happened to him and how he plateaued and fell off a cliff then so quickly, hopefully, uh, maybe since he – got out of that slump and then he was in so much of a slump last year he's also obviously gonna hit 160 because of how much of a slump he started with the season maybe that'll help i know they said when they when i had some of the baltimore stuff on when i was watching youtube they said he looked good in spring but again this is camp so i don't know like this yeah. is I you gotta be careful with gonna, that yeah i don't know how he's gonna look when um all these great pitchers come in against us and not just some of these other pitchers of people's team. But um, other than that, are there um, any guys or on our roster that you look at and go who you think could really step up for us this year? And then after that, we'll move on to who we think will be our easiest opponents battling against our locales, um, our own division, and then the counter division in the area, the ALE. Um, but who do you think is a guy on our roster that everyone's not looking at that might step up? Um, I think a big piece here, everyone loves to talk about JT. Everyone loves to talk about Bryce. Everyone mentions oh, – Reece- You could say Andrew Knapp for a second. <laughs> Andrew Knapp. That's, that's, you know, my feelings on Andrew Knapp. No, because you said uh, everybody um, likes to talk about JT, so I thought you were about to say Andrew Knapp. <laughs> No, Every- I'm sorry. That's 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 why I was surprised. That's why I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just no, shocked for a second. I thought you were about to say. Um, everybody loves to talk about Hoskins' first half compared to his second half. Everyone loves to talk about uh, Gregorius and bringing him in and everything. Here's a big position, and I think this position can go a long way to determine this team's success. And I not that I don't like to pick two names here, but I have to pick two names because we don't know who's going to get the job. It might be a platoon. It might be whoever's on the hotter streak. We don't know what's going to happen until we see what happens when that lineup's released tomorrow. And I think you probably know where I'm going with this. But I think a big spot here, which can define some of your offensive success, is going to be the duo in center field and Adam Hazley and Roman Quinn. I really think we all know what Hazley did when he came up last year and Fantastic defender. It took a little bit to get going hitting wise, but everybody does when you come up, and we all were fine with him by a season then. Um, Roman Quinn has potential for days. We all know he's got talent. The question is, how long does he stay healthy for? And he's already they tested. They both his- have a lot of potential, and the good thing is they're easy to platoon. One's left handed, one's, uh, I think, Quinn's switching again, right? He's switching. Full time. So yeah, he's got so. the edge. Yeah, so um, one, one that's easy for platooning. But. And my other thing is, well, well, Quinn's already testing his luck, so we'll see how long he lasts. I mean, he got hit by like four pitches, I feel like, in the you two, three expedition, exhibition games he played. The amount of times I'd look at my phone and be like a notification right, okay. from one of the beat reporters. He also got Roman, hit by the throw over. Yeah, it was Roman Quinn hit by hit by pitch, stays in the game. Roman mm-hmm. Quinn hit by uh, the um, pickoff attempt, pickoff, yeah. stays in the game after staying down for a little bit. I'm like, man, they're already testing his limit. But I love Roman Quinn, you know that. Um, nothing against Hazley. I think he's a great player. But if I'm Joe Girardi tomorrow night, I'm giving the start to Roman Quinn. I really think his speed can go a long way. His the, the amount of range he can play in the defense when you have 
Obviously, we have Harper, but you get who knows where you're going to get McCutcheon speed wise coming off the ACL. Uh, so I like the little quicker Quinn there, it helped cover ground in that sense. Um, and here's my thing, and I'm interested to in what what your thoughts on this take might be. And I know it's not going to happen. I already know who the leadoff hitter is tomorrow night, or we're expecting it to be McCutcheon. Mm-hmm. But if I was Joe Girardi making this lineup, I would really consider, if not do it, I think I would do it, at least for the first game or two, is put Roman Quinn at leadoff and Andrew McCutcheon at two. I, I you really could even think... put Hazley at leadoff. He's a guy that's a contact guy if he gets in the lineup. See, I was... See, see to me... I Paisley flipped. isn't that much different than McCutcheon in that sense, but my my thing but he's is faster at this point of his career to table. He is, but he's not. The reason why I would go Quinn is because Quinn, if he gets on, he's gonna. He, there's a good chance he's stealing second. He's almost right. like a Billy Hamilton. He gets yeah. on, he's on second. Now you got McCutcheon to drive him in, or at least get him over, and, and get him over to third. Then at that point, one out, and then you have Harper get the sack fly rather than. Obviously, McCutcheon's a good player, but who knows what McCutcheon does? Mm-hmm. And then Quinn comes up. If he gets on, you're not going to just get a sack fly. I, I think, and that's and here's the counter. And, and it sounds funny because you throw him at one, but I, I think he's got two options, maybe three. I, I could see him at a two spot. I'd be fine with him in the two hole. Go McCutcheon, Quinn, I guess. But I really think it's going to be he either bats lead off. Well, he bats ninth, and you use that speed As to turn team. over. Yeah, turn it over. Especially with the DH now, it's not like, oh, you're sacrificing the pitcher hitting eighth. So now you put Quinn at nine, have him turn over to the leadoff spot, where essentially you're getting the same thing in Quinn to McCutcheon to Harper, just at a later stage. Um, but so I'm interested to see what they do with the lineup. If it was me, personally, I'll say it real quick. I think i go Quinn, McCutcheon, Harper, um, Hoskins, Real Muto, Gregorius, or er, yeah, yeah, I got Gregorius, absolutely. Bruce. No, I want to see Bruce is an eight here, though. I was gonna say split up the lefties there and go Gregorius, Segura, Bruce, but I don't like Bruce in the eight spot, so maybe maybe put Bruce at six, Segura seven. Gregorius eight, Kingery nine, or something like that. Yeah, because um, Kingery has speed with Girardi. A I'll guy tell you what, though, base runners to be more aggressive. That's not a big guy to have at the bottom of the lineup. Kingery at nine. That shows how yeah. dangerous this lineup can be. When I was talking to somebody else about it yesterday, my uh, buddy Connor, um, I, and you know, I said this on Chasing the Pennant. I was a big believer. I want Bohm in the lineup right away. So I, that's why that's what threw me off right there when I was going down it. Because when I was going through yesterday, I put. Uh, Gregorius at six, Bohm at seven to split the lefty righty, and then just went with the righties at the end and Segura Kingery. So that, that's why that's what threw me off there. Um, yeah. putting Bruce back in there. Uh, cause I think, I think now with Bohm not making it, you're most likely going to have Bruce be your DH. Uh, maybe Neil Walker against some lefties, but is yeah. garlic, garlic's a lefty, right? Garlic's a, le- a righty. No, he can hit lefties. He might actually be the guy against lefties. He's a power hitter, too, so he could be put in again. I forget what I'm thinking of, but, uh, yeah. So, it's – we'll see what happens. That, that would yeah. be my lineup, though. I agree. I see where you're coming. I, I had it flipped, though, because I thought Caleb Smith originally was starting tomorrow, but he's starting Saturday. So, Saturday going matchup-wise, I think Girardi, kind of from reading into what he said about the Quinn and Hazley thing – I feel like he would put Hazley in against a fastball gunner in Alcantara. And then because Quinn's a great switch hitter, uh, well, not a great switch hitter, but he's a good switch hitter. Um, Caleb Smith would probably go to Roman Quinn. And then if both do well in their games, you just have a tough decision playing against, uh, I think it's Urena. Yeah, Urena in uh, the third game. Then you just have you just have to pick between the two. Um, I, I just feel like since it seems like maybe I'm reading into it too much, but from his quotes, it seemed like they were going to go matchup based with it. That the matchup based would go Hazley for against Alcantara and then Quinn against Kale. So because I don't think Hazley matches up that great against Smith. So I would that I would put a uh, Quinn in against him and then put uh, Hazley in in the first game if you want to actually get them. 
both in the first couple games because it doesn't make sense to put Hazley in the second game with that matchup. Yeah, and you bring up since you bring up matchups, I'll say this real quick because I, I was looking at the preview already for tomorrow. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I got no life. That's what I'm looking at. <laughs> I'm excited for baseball. I'm looking at the previews. Um, and, and you bring up the matchups, and, and you mentioned those two. And tomorrow, it's going to be early. Obviously, we don't know. We're hoping. We'll, we'll, I mean, we all believe in Girardi. We'll see what kind of manager he is in terms of analytics and numbers. And, and we'll see it tomorrow, honestly, with how it plays out. Because Jay Bruce, as we expect him to be the DH, he's 0 for 9 against Alcantara. So uh, it's be interesting to see if that plays He'll into a factor. Maybe. Plays into a factor whether we get a Bruce tomorrow. Um, Hazley and Quint. Neil Walker was on the Marlins last year. Uh, yes. So he knows. <laughs> yeah, he's, there's your, he's, there's, there's your he's DH o, for tomorrow. He's 0 for 1 against Alcantara. So he ha- does have a plate appearance. He has um, one, he, and he's been he's on for one. last year. So. You bring up Quinn and Hazley. They don't have a lot off them. They're both 1 for 3 against him. So take oh, it for what you want. He ain't used since he's a good poker to each side of the field hitter, but that's more of a that whole situation's weird it, with the whole waiting to DA. waiting to announce him on the roster. It's almost like will he be ready? Like it, it, is he dealing with something where he's gonna be like close to late to the ballpark or something tomorrow? I don't know. Uh, that's why it seems like he's in a weird spot. So I don't think they give him the start first day. Um that's just a good because point. it seems like something I don't they won't say what it is and obviously it doesn't have the virus because he was officially placed on the roster. Mm-hmm. So I'm just I don't know. It's, it's a, a weird family thing, or maybe like yeah, something I don't, to take care of. Before. And, and for those who don't know what we're talking about, when the Phillies announced their final roster, uh, rosters had to be cut to a minimum of thirty, or excuse me, maximum of thirty, minimum of twenty-five by uh, noon today, Eastern. When the Phillies announced it, they only put twenty-nine guys on there, and it was originally announced that they probably won't add the thirtieth in Phil Goslin until tomorrow, but. I mean, it was maybe only, an hour and yeah. a half, two hours, and they announced that he's on the roster. So, yeah. like Joe mentioned, maybe it's something family. The we only don't really thing know. I gathered from it, situation. too, was moving stuff around because he wasn't on the actual roster. Like, he was a non-roster invitee. So but he was they, on the 40-man, right? So it wouldn't matter. Did they add him during summer camp, or did they add him just today to the 40-man? I couldn't tell you if he was on there. I, I'm not going to lie. I'm just assuming he was on there, considering he was on the big club last year. Uh, because he came back as a non-roster invitee from what I read from Todd Zalecki's article earlier. That's why he wouldn't have had to be on the 40-man as a non-roster invitee. That's that's what that, I get. Well, you could be right. I, I will say the – I don't I don't know. Um, Who knows? Either way, I, I, I don't think he'll be starting tomorrow from the point you said. So I would probably say Neil Walker if they don't – if they go with matches because he only has one at bat. He's seen him all last year being on his team. So that would make the most sense to me. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to go with another guy. Yeah, and, and Bruce is just a weird guy. I don't know where he fits into the lineup. And don't get me wrong. I think he's a great bat. He's got power. I think I he just, has to be top six. But, like, so, like, could you possibly go, if you put Quinn at, say, nine, and, and sorry to keep going on this this topic, but could you possibly say McCutcheon one? Would you ever think about, and, and that was a stretch, but would you ever think about going to Harper two? Bruce three, Hoskins four. We like Bruce not fit that three spot. Bruce is not ex- it, like if Bruce is hitting like he did when he first came over, then he would kind of hit the three spot. But he doesn't normally hit like that. Normally, he's more like a power guy to the uh, off the wall power doubles guy and homer guy, not the guy that hits for average. So he's and, more of a four if you're going to do anything, but then you have to move Hoskins down to five, and then JT would be six. So that wouldn't really. Yeah, that's why I just think it's – and that's what I think Bruce only fits. I think he's only a three-six hitter just because of the way the Phillies are. Mm-hmm. Like you're not going to put him at four over Hoskins. No, I agree with that. I just don't five think he's put JT. six. And that's why he's just – and don't get me wrong, I love – he seems like a good guy. And, again, he obviously came in and did a lot a lot of good stuff last year. I'm just curious where – and I'm trying to remember where he hit in the lineup last year. I really don't remember. Normally, and I know, he, hit, normally he hit in the upper tier because we had in, we didn't have – um we had uh, injuries in our outfield because he came when Kutch. Oh, he came like a day away. or two after Kutch. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so he, normally he hit in the middle tier of our lineup. Okay, so it, it's it's gonna. Be I don't think he's gonna hit out. below six because he's not a below the six spot hitter. But yeah. I think uh, we have a chance. Um, 
because of our lineup to I don't know how much, but go over a thirty one wins if that was the over under. The over under is thirty one and a half. Okay, well, fine, we can get thirty two wins. What you um, what'd you say on chasing the pennant? I said I said we might get more than that, so I think we could definitely get thirty two wins because we I said we could potentially I think I said what thirty four so and mm-hmm. I said that could potentially win the division because you're going to have the battles this year you're going to have guys that could get nicked up quicker because we came back so quick uh, there might be those ticky tacky arm injuries that put a pitcher out for one start and then you get a random guy to face you so uh, it all but I I think we have a chance this year in this uh, rush of a season because I think our lineup might be able to carry us. And I think Spencer Howard is going to pitch really well. I think he's an X factor when he comes up. So is boom. Uh, I think he's going to play very well as a youngster. So the two young X factors are going to bring that win total, or as Brian Kenny would say, our overall team war up. So, so I guess when boom does come up, I guess you have two legitimate left-handed hitters. And then depending on Quinn or Hazley. Right, because you just have Harper and Didi, and then um, Hazley when he plays, and then Quinn against a righty, but mm-hmm. he's a switch. So that, right? I don't think I'm missing anyone. No. Um. That, that's I, that's I, and I don't take too much into it. I just like noting how many left-handed hitters you have. Um. So I, I always yeah, because Walker's it. also switch, so he ain't just a lefty. So yeah. No, but I think that's true. But um, moving uh, on, unless if you had a couple other things you wanted to say about the Phillies, we had a fun fan interactive segment we did about some favorite players that are not on the Phillies that some people did. And we're not going to cover everyone that said Mike Trout because that was about 17,000 <laughs> people. Um, but we'll go over some of those people and shout them out and then do other people. But did you have any stuff? to close out the Phillies-related topics, and then some of these might come back to being Phillies-related in the end. Well, real quick, you just mentioned you wanted to talk about who I thought were the toughest teams we're going to be facing this year. and um, Yeah, you kind of got into it just while talking about other stuff. That's the only reason I didn't. Bring... Uh, that's fair. I talked about yeah. our toughest the eight teams or whatever. Um, yeah. But real quick, personally, I'll just say um, the toughest team, I think uh, – I think the Nationals are will be the Phillies' toughest team to face uh, in terms of matchup-wise. I think the Phillies don't match up well at Washington. Um, and I said this before, and maybe I'm maybe I'm being um, optim- optimistic, obviously, but um, biased to my team. But I don't think I am. I really think the Phillies, at their best, can match up with anybody offensively outside the Dodgers. Obviously, the Dodgers are just on another tier. <laughs> yeah. the Dodgers are just on another tier. But I really think you put the Phillies lineup against most of the other teams, they can match up really well. So the reason why – that's why I think – I don't think the Braves pitching is worlds above us. No. They, I mean, they have – it's a little better, but it's not worlds above us. But And that's why I and give the Nationals – Yeah, so they're already struggling in that sense. That's why I give the Nationals our toughest matchup to face in the division because they have Scherzer, Strasburg, Corbin um, – I'm blanking on who they're filling out because uh, Ross is out now because he's not playing with the virus. Or not that he has isn't, it, but he's just playing isn't safe. Austin, isn't Austin uh, both or Voth one of their pitchers? It might be. I, I forget because they also lost Tanner Roark so, uh, to the Blue Jays. Blue Jays. Yeah, he went to um, the Blue Jays. So, but, again, they have that, and then they match up well in the bullpen too. Sean Doolittle, I feel like the Phillies never hit. Um, I feel like he always just comes in. Like I feel like when Sh- Sean Doolittle comes in, they still have Sanchez. Just Animal. expect a zero from the Phillies. Yeah. Like when, when Doolittle comes in, mm-hmm. so that's why I picked the Nationals. I think Braves are better on paper, but Nationals matchup wise are our toughest. And then I agree with you on that because Austin, then, Austin Voth and Anibal Sanchez were the other two, by the way. Okay. Yeah. And everyone calls me crazy, but. Yankees, I think, are overrated. So I really think, again, our toughest matchup because of the teams, and I'm not even a Rays fan, but I, I talk bad on the Rays as well, but our toughest matchup in the AL East will be the Tampa Bay Rays in the sense of their pitching. They have Blake Snell, Charlie Morton. Um, who's the third guy that's really good? Glass uh, now. 
Yeah, Glasnow. Glasnow. Yeah. And then, was it, Ryan Weiss? Ryan, I forget. Yeah, yeah, I bet Yarbrough. Like that. Yarbrough. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan. He's not a bad pitcher either. He's a solid 4-5 option. And like option. I said, watch so, out for that guy, Beeks, because they never used him to his full effect yet. He might get used more this year. So. That too. So, again, just because of those. And that's why I fear a pitching game. I really think the Phillies yeah. can go toe-to-toe offensively with most teams. But when if you get into a lock of a, a 0-0 or a three-three game, and, and you're turning it to the pen, or like even deeper. If you're, say it's game three or four in a seven-game series, we're looking at who's our three starter, Joe. Well, right now it's Vinny. Vinny, and if you're if you're talking about playoffs, you're going Vinny's going up against a Patrick Corbin, or I mean, I know it's a long shot, but a Phillies a Phillies Rays rematch, you're going up against the Glass now, or Morton, or a or a Snell, depending on which Snell shows up. I mean, obviously, we all know who we're picking in that sense. So that's why I think matchup-wise, the Phillies would really struggle against those yeah. teams. No, I completely agree, and you made that fairly easy to uh, move to the next topic because you took the two teams that I also was <laughs> looking at because we don't match up well pitching-wise, and the Mets don't have um, as good a pitching losing Noah Syndergaard. That very detrimentally hurts mm-hmm. them. Um, and the Braves don't have as proven of pitching Yet, so you need to see more coming back to back years where the Nationals have proven guys. And Adibal Sanchez actually has figured out how to be a good pitcher without velocity at this point of his career and be a good four or five. Austin Voth is just a just a solid depth yeah. pitcher that, but he could probably be a fifth pitcher for the time being for it. So I completely agree with that. And the Rays pitching doesn't stack. The Rays lineup, we have a better lineup, but the Rays pitching doesn't stack up against, uh, or it stacks up better against us, I meant to say. But um, unless if we had anything else on that, we have, like I said, a million um, – so a lot of people submitted the same people. So at least we got it uh, from yeah, that. We'll, and we'll but, go through as many as possible, and whoever we don't get to, we'll get to in uh, future podcasts because, again, when we get to these final segments, we're usually running close on time, and we don't want to go too long. So we'll, uh, we'll make sure we get to everyone else in, in the next, and yeah. we'll, we'll keep going from there. Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep uh, bringing these up in uh, each podcast uh, and keep submitting them too as well. Yeah, glad, glad we're getting the feedback. Thank you. And um, we have uh, Bob Robbie Gallagher was one of the first people to say Mike Trout. So Mike Trout's a guy that everybody <laughs> says around around uh, the Phillies for a favorite player, local area. Uh, obviously, now that he committed to playing, uh, Mike Trout's still going to have a stellar. Um, season yet again there's no reason to say he's not um, probably MVP level season assuming he stays healthy again so um, I would say I would assume you would agree with that yeah I mean Mike Trout is uh, without doubt the best player in the game um, this year I-, I think he will he's my pick to win AL MVP I'm interested to see if he does have to miss a lot of time that could cost him the MVP That's a good I point. will say not that anyone cares but he did that did cost him first pick in my one of my fantasy drafts. I actually passed up on Trout first overall just because of knowing the time period he was gonna miss. It's probably gonna be at least a week. Um when he does have his kid with the whole quarantine process and stuff and in a short year you don't want, want that. So uh I will say it did cost him first in fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, uh, yeah, it's definitely it happens, but um there's a guy that was surprising, one of the surprise names that popped up. Uh, he did fairly decent last year. He had 63 RBI, 23 uh, homers, still continues to hit the homers and ribbies, was Kyle Seeger of the Seattle Mariners. Wow. <laughs> was uh, somebody's answer, and that was an answer for Robbie Showers. So thank you for that answer. Um that was someone's answer. He again, he continues to hit the ribbies. Uh, has he's a fun player to watch too. Corey's brother um, always was pretty good player. It's just unfortunately they were never able to get a good team out there during his prime, and that's just the way that it was. But uh, he's still a solid player, fun to watch. I actually kind of hope he gets traded at some time for the sake of his career, so he can go somewhere and be that solid DH or good fielding third or first baseman. Uh, on a team that's actually competing. Because, again, RBI potential and power is all people care about in today's game anyway. Like Shane always says, no one really looks at the batting average as much anymore. So, Yeah, no, I agree. And that's that's actually a fun uh, 
that's a good pool. I like that pool. That's a good player that not a lot of people think of. Um, you mentioned it. I mean, I've always been a fan of his as well. I like he's one of the West Coast guys you like watching after uh, after the Phillies get done. And if he could ever get to a good team, and he's able to hit 23 bombs in, in I believe Seattle's a, a more pitcher's park, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he's able to hit 23 yeah. bombs in a pitcher's park with 63 RBIs, but driving in um, a, a, t- a bad team. I mean, obviously we know J.P. Crawford because he's there, and then Malik Smith. Outside of that, there's not too many other house household names on that roster. So if you if you throw him in the middle of, say, I mean, whatever contending team you want to throw in. And like you said, I think this year you're going to get the teams that will be high on Seager, I think, will be a lot of NL teams come to DH time because the ALs probably already got their DH fulfilled unless someone's struggling or hurt. So I think Kyle Seager could be on the move maybe to an NL team. And and I don't know. I mean, you throw him in a lineup of the Cubs or the the Reds, the Brewers. I mean, the, that's a destination I could actually see him. In Milwaukee. Now that I say that Brewers. That's a good point. I mean, I don't know who's supposed to DH with them, but they lost Eric Thames in the Nationals. He would have been a solid DH option. Maybe they, lose, they lose Travis Travis Shaw to uh, Blue Jays, I believe. Um, I guess Braun would be the heavy. Well, I don't know what their first base or outfit options are. I forget. Didn't they add Garcia? Didn't they add that guy? I could be thinking of it. I thought one they might have. have the side um, so I, I could see Seeger in a Milwaukee uniform. Imagine him. Being able to drive in Yelich and all them, those guys, a contending team, he could get up there. I mean, obviously not this year, but in a full year, probably closer to 90 RBIs uh, on a real roster. And uh, no, that's that's a fantastic pool. I really like that. Yeah. No, another fun pool that somebody uh, had was um, Nick Markakis, which obviously is a player that's done good throughout <laughs> um, the Philly his, killer, his career. Um, but he's a guy that I like. Somebody said that because he's not a guy that everybody would think of and everybody would go for. And that was uh, Alex Conaway uh, that said that. And he's a player that, again, um, because I uh, know I am not a closet Orioles fan. We just had trips that we went to Baltimore um, in high school. But I saw him uh, in Baltimore, too, when he was still hitting – his like 300 batting average days. And then he went to the Braves and continued to hit really well. Now this year, there's no predictions for Nick Markakis because Nick Markakis decided to opt out of the season. Um, but the guys had a great career. Um, he hit 285 last year. If that ends up being his final season, he had a 356 on base. It's a good final season to go out on. Personally, I think he will probably come back next year, but uh, if he does, he'll probably continue to hit pretty well. That guy just knows how to hit. Yeah, no, I, before we went to the Braves, I always liked Mark Hickes. He's a guy that plays the game right, could do both things, um, offensively and defensively. He was always well-respected, always heard great veteran leadership stuff about him, and that's another very solid pool. Um, I never lost respect for him, but I couldn't cheer for him or like him as much because – Yes, I am annoying like that, and since he's on the Braves, it does <laughs> decrease his value to me a little bit. But no, it's it's I love that pool. That's another really good one. That uh, not not an obvious answer, and I'm interested to see how much longer he has to to play because he's obviously. I mean, I feel like he's been in the league forever. I couldn't <laughs> yeah. give you an exact. I couldn't give you an exact number, but like, I just feel like he's a guy that he just finds a way to continue to do it. And credit to him, he adjusted with the different times of the game. And that, that's where you really see some of these older guys not be able to adjust like that. So, um, he's I'm even actually, in the league since I was six. I'm surprised he's 36. I would have went a little over that, but, uh, yeah. So obviously I was six, 14 year career. Uh, very good. I'm sure obviously he's skipping this year, but I'm sure he'll be back uh, ready for 2021, but a uh, very nice pool. We also got a brotherly pool in ours. Um, Paula Heineman Haltman. I think I said that right. I'm sorry if I did not say that right. Uh, she picked Corey Seeger, who's Kyle's brother, of course, um, as her favorite player, not in the Phillies. Corey Seeger's a player I always loved. He's a two time Silver Slugger, Rookie of the Year, two time All Star, then had, I think it was Tommy John, some arm related. One of the, one of the few, one few of the, uh, the arm related. position players, yeah. Yeah, one of the uh, – and uh, but he's coming back stronger, I think. I think he's going to have a good year. Hell, he had a pretty damn good year last year. He had 19 homers and 
87 RBIs. I don't think people realize actually how good of a year the kid had last year. Um, so I think coming into this year, he's going to have a pretty damn good year for the Dodgers. Um, and just build off of uh, last season when he also had his like ridiculous doubles year and was hitting gap to gap ridiculously and looked his best since his all-star days of 16, 17. So I would say for Dodgers fans, which is scary because you're the Dodgers already, you're getting the old Corey Seager back. So congratulations. Yeah. And I will say this. I, I love Corey Seager. He, I really think if he finds a way to, to beat out the health issues, he could be one of the, he could be a top five shortstop in this league. Mm-hmm. I, I truly believe that. Him at his best, him healthy, and I've always been a fan, especially when he first came up. I remember the hype around him rookie year, and you mentioned he won rookie of the year. He lived up to it, and uh, he's a guy I'm interested to see. And he's a guy that might might be walking. He might be leaving L.A. in the next year. He's a free agent after this season. He's a guy I'd go after. Nothing against Gregorius, but I would love to sign Gregorius for one year. Well, I guess we got Bryce and Stott in the, in the upcoming, so maybe – Maybe he doesn't fit us as well as I first originally jumped out to me. The name, again, I like him, so I'd be all for getting him. But uh, I'm interested to see what kind of contract his value adds when um, because of the injury. So I'm interested to see. Obviously, fantastic player. I love the guy. I'm interested to see, because of injuries, how what kind of contract he gets. That's is it a, a one-year prove-me deal? Because obviously you get this weird year, and then maybe next year – he does Gregorius, signs a one-year prove-me deal, shows he can stay healthy for 162, um, and uh, then, yeah, you move on from there. Yeah, I think it really depends with him because uh, you got um, – you can give a prove-it deal, but he also played 134. He had his most played appearances since his All-Star game, so I think if he plays all 60 this year, uh, he's probably not going to be uh, – willing to just take a one-year deal because he's going to show he played 134, which is a pretty good clip, followed by the whole 60-game season. Then if he has no injuries in the postseason, because obviously the Dodgers are making the postseason. Um, if they don't, they're a disgrace to the game. <laughs> uh, so the uh, so he's going to uh, get better in that. That's going to be interesting where his market's at. That's a very good point. Yeah, because especially with not to sell the Dodgers for too long, but they got that uh, Gavin Lux kid. I think mm-hmm. he's supposed to be a and shortstop. And he didn't even make he didn't even make the damn roster. Yeah, and he's <laughs> supposed to be a shortstop. So I think they're going to go his direction over the guy that kind of gets hurt a little bit. So uh, my my early prediction is, especially after the Betts deal, and then they're going to be wanting to up uh, Walker Buehler in the coming days as well. Will Smith, another fantastic, probably the best prospected young catcher. Um, obviously JT's the best catcher, but Will Smith's probably the best prospected catcher outside the Baltimore guy I'm talking about like right now in the league. Um, so I, they're going to have guys coming up on payroll. So I think Corey Seager is the guy they're going to let walk. So my early 2021 prediction is Corey Seager will be wearing a different uniform than the Dodgers. Gotcha. Good prediction, but that'll be, we'll see who that is. That could be a <laughs> game changer. If he, if he's back, like I said, that's a game changer for, there a you go. Indians trade Francisco Lindor next uh, off season. Sign Corey Seager. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, Here's one of my favorite players that Martin Caden brought up with a great picture of him making that sweet throw where he just lifts his foot and zips it across. Matty Chapman of the Oakland Athletics. Mm-hmm. Um, Matt Chapman's already a two-time gold glover, a two-time platinum glover. His bat's getting better and better each year. Um, he dipped in the average a little bit last year. But he obviously uh, had his most RBIs last year and homers dipping in his um, batting average statistics. So I think he's going to get better and better each year. I think he had a great hitting year contact wise, 18, 19, made the all star game, had the power and RBIs. And then this is the year he's going to kind of put two and two together. So I think this is actually the year he was really slated to take off at the age of 27. So. Yeah, I'm really excited to see what Chapman does this year. Um, like you, I'm I'm a big uh, – I really like Matt Chapman. Uh, I think he is arguably the second best uh, two-way third baseman in the league. I'm not I'm, – I don't think he's better than Arenado. Um, he, no, I'm a huge Nolan Arenado fan. I think he's the best third baseman in the game and the best two-way third, third baseman. Um, and I think Chapman's probably a very close second at this point, depending on what kind of offensive numbers he, he picks up. And – and here, I, I'm going to put this prediction out there as well. 
I think Matt. I, I'm. It's funny. I like a lot of these these names that are being pulled are really good. But my here's my thing about Matt Chapman. You met, you mentioned his continued development in offense. Mm-hmm. He will take it a step further this year, and I truly believe. I think he helps and leads this A's team with the other offense. He's able to drive and runs. I think he leads this A's team to the World Series. Okay, I like it. Then you have the Matt. You're gonna to have to have the other Matt help him with that too. The Matt. The, the Matt. <laughs> yeah. <dude>. Matt. <laughs> yeah. Um, with, yeah. With what's Matt, Matt Olson? Olson? Yeah. yeah Matt, Matt Olson. Olson. Yeah, that's a great combination. Yeah. That's a, the A's, by the way. Uh, anybody that has MLB the show, play a season with the A's. <laughs> great trade value, people. Two mats on the corners. You're already safe yeah. there. Sean Murphy's a stud. You know, yeah. uh, you got you got some good guys there. Now, somebody had a great joke guy in here. Um, Joe Stratton, which I laughed at this when I saw it. He said Roy Hobbs. <laughs> <laughs> so, How's it going? For, for people that don't know, uh, Roy <laughs> Hobbs is from the movie The Natural. Um, so that's a uh, that's a movie baseball movie reference, but that was pretty funny. But another player I love that someone put in here, Robert Wright, said Whit Murrayfield. This is a player that still isn't talked about enough somehow. Well, um, it's because he's on. Can- Sorry to cut you I off. But it's because he's on yeah. Kansas City. I mean, <laughs> listen, you you don't get you don't have Mike Trout talked about enough. We talked about marketing in the MLB. You expect Whit Murrayfield to get marketed when he's on a sixty win ball club, if that. You're making all the right points, but the problem <laughs> is he's so good. No, he, I, he, <laughs> I agree with you. He's a guy I wish the Phillies would trade for every single trade deadline. He's a guy I wish they'd get, uh, they'd bring in. And uh, no, he, he's always been one of my favorites, and he knows how to he's he knows how to do everything, and he's a great utility guy. Um, I really wish he's a guy I would want to see play postseason baseball. I really do. Yes. Um, yeah. We already did. Uh, he was not a huge part of it, but I think yeah, he, played, yeah. he was a cup of like, didn't he play a few games the year they won the World Series? I think I think so. But I mean, like yeah. now that he really found his role, he established himself. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I need to see that, too, because I'm I don't trying to him. picture I'm trying to picture a destination for him uh, come the trade deadline. I'll think of a team by the show. And I don't know how many I don't I think we're running close. So we're running close to the hour. Um, uh, we're a little bit past it, but I don't. It doesn't matter with Anchor how I upload it now because it no, okay. th- th- There's no worry there. But uh, somebody else's a uh, great youngster, um, f- son of a Hall of Famer, Flad Junior is uh, Jerry Schaefer's favorite player. Not on the Phillies. That's a good one. Now that he's moving to DH and first base, I think that's really they have Travis Shaw. They brought him up there. Now that I uh, realize the dynamics of the organizational dynamics and why they brought Shaw, even though his play's decreasing a bit, I, I actually went, oh, that's actually really smart. Yeah. So um, the Blue Jays, very smart now. Um, but uh, they were really doing some great things up there. Vlad Jr., I think that's the position to let him really get comfortable on offense because you don't want him overthinking too much. He's not the best fielder. Uh, he's probably better at first base. I think that's huge, and I think that's where he'll probably take off and flourish. Nah, I, I agree with you. I think uh, that's sub. I think that's another name that a lot of people aren't going to know, and that's a very, very good pull on that end. No, um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. No, no, I no, you're good. Go ahead. But uh, no, it's and, and that's a that's a team if they get going, a lot of these guys click, and, and he's going to have to be a big part of it with the guys around him. Um, I, he he could do a lot for that team to help get him into the playoffs or try to get to the playoffs. No, I completely agree. Um, he's a guy that just he's going to do a lot for any team if they're going to get to the playoffs. But uh, we're moving. Some people had weird uh, people, I must say, uh, in terms of how the rivalries go. One guy had a um great uh veteran that a uh, present um clint um clint copper three i don't know how to say his last name so i'm sorry for mispronouncing that he has a really <laughs> hard last name to say but he had zim who's a great veteran been a great player for all his career great hitter started more as a power hitter good third baseman until he had the shoulder issue and wasn't the best at fielding, moved over to first. Obviously a, a great career baseball player, also opted out of this year. 
Um, but if he comes back, uh, if he decides to play again, he'll probably just continue to do decent and do his thing. And uh, for him, because of his back, a year off might actually be a blessing in disguise almost if he does come back. Yeah, he's a guy. I mean, a lot of respect how long he's been in the game, the true national first ever pick by the Nationals after switching from the Expos. Uh, he's been there his whole career, and I always think about the amount of times he's killed us. I mean, I just get flashbacks when I hear his name of – it might have been Brad Lidge pitching. I can't remember, but, like, the grand, the walk-off – I don't know if you remember it, but the walk-off grand slam just replays in my head every once in a while. <laughs> like, it, it just sits there, and he's a well-respected guy, and a lot of credit to him. In a year where people thought he was going to retire and who knows how he's going to come back because he is getting older, he was willing to put the game aside um, and do what was right and, and worry about his family and credit to him. Yeah, I completely agree. That's a very good point. Uh, you have but, to worry about all that stuff before you worry about the uh, game of baseball, obviously. But what were you saying? I was going to say, real quick, going back to Whit Mayfield to, to wrap it up here, um, the Reds. I'd love to see him on that Reds team. And I know you were going to say they got Moose at second. Well, I, here's why I like Moose isn't a second baseman, though. They could move Moose somewhere. Well, I, okay. Well, I was going to say you get him, put Joey Votto at DH. That way you keep his health good. Move Moose to first with Mayfield yeah. at second. A team we're already high on. I would love that lineup. That would be pretty solid. That would be ridiculous. Yeah, that, that, would, be, uh, that would be absolutely ridiculous. That wouldn't be uh, that fair um, much at all. Um, but uh, to wrap it up, because we had a couple interesting ones that people said in Philly's groups, uh, you brought. I wanted to bring them up because I know uh, Bill Rose said Giancarlo Stanton. Obviously, the guy has Paul Bunyan-like power, can be a great middle piece of your lineup. The problem is he hasn't stayed healthy any of these last few seasons. <clears throat> Excuse me. And like Biscuit pointed out in our Chasing the Pennant podcast, He's a guy that also gets injured DH, and unfortunately, he just gets those fluky injuries you can't really explain now. So I like how dynamic he can be as a player and watching him. I hate the Yankees, but I like how fun he can be to watch. Um, but uh, the problem is he's never on the field much, so I don't know if that's your similar take on him. I've honestly, not just because he's on the Marlins, I've never been a big Jim Carlos Stanton fan. Um, he's never been able to stay on the field uh, for a full year, really. He's never been a healthy guy. I think he's too much of a strikeout or nothing guy or home run to strikeout guy. I don't think he's as reliable as people make him out to be. That's why I'm not as high on the Yankees as a lot of other people because I don't think he's as reliable as people uh, give him credit for. I think, uh, again, his power and his monster bombs are fantastic to watch. I mean, mm-hmm. I love watching it. But I, as a guy, honestly, as a Phillies fan, he, he's a guy I'd always stay away from. Like even on yeah. the trade rumors, like he's to me, there's just plenty of better options out there. And uh, again, nothing again. I mean, again, the, the home runs he's able to hit is great, and he fits in with the Yankees, obviously the Brock Bombers, everyone calls them um, throughout their history. So he fits in well with them. But overall, he's just never been my biggest guy. No, no, that makes sense. No, I kind of agree with that. A guy that I think is a very dynamic and hit the ball for more contact and power if he's able to stay on the field that's also on the Brox Bombers is Gloria Ballman Radico's favorite player Aaron Judge um he's more of a guy that in my opinion when he's going strong isn't strikeout or nothing per se he actually can have more gaps to gap power and be that power hitter where Stan was not able to do that since kind of his heyday with the Marlins. You saw him having gaps to gap before his injuries really struck. Um, but I would say Judge is a more dynamic overall player. His big issue is also just staying on the field. Yeah, I, I like Judge more than Stanton. Um, it's pretty funny seeing that big, tall guy there out there doing that. <laughs> uh, not, you don't usually see that in baseball, so I always think that's funny and Another guy he can hit he's home runs pretty good. And he's a funny guy, too. Yeah. He's not he, he's willing to say things and do what it takes to get his opinion across. So, no, I, I, a lot of respect to Judge. And um, his guy, I hope that can stay healthy and stuff. Because I, I, I respect Judge. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm a huge fan of him. But um, I like him overall. Yeah, I think he'll have a good year if he can stay healthy. I think Stan will have a good year if he can stay healthy. Because he has power and RBI potential. He just... 
like you said, strikes out more. But like everyone says, no one seems to care about that anymore. So, you know, <laughs> um, I as, care about it. As long as he has the home runs and RBIs, according to everyone else, they're fine. I miss the I miss the Juan <laughs> Pierre days. The um, even Jimmy Rollins. I mean, he was more. He was one of the more power hitters in a, lot, a leadoff spot. But he's a guy who got I on stall. I, I yeah. miss. I miss those days, and it's a shame to see that kind of start to leave baseball a little bit. But uh, it's that's that's what I got. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, to wrap it up, I figure we would go with someone that had uh, a couple guys that uh, I know everyone liked. James Wolfie said Ichiro and uh, rest in peace, Tony Gwynn. Um, of course, Tony Gwynn is one of the best hitters of all time. Um, and you can't say anything bad about Tony Gwynn as a hitter. If you left one over, he was going to take you law yard. If you left one on the outside, he was going to poke it down the line. If you left it inside, he was going to rip it down the right field line. Um, and the same kind of went with Ichiro take out the, uh, home run total, but, uh, the same kind of went with Ichiro because Ichiro, like they always said, was kind of one of those guys that would annoy you because you knew when he wanted to hit a home run, he would take that bigger swing and then he would have that clutch home run. And I remember Seattle's announcer said that once uh, when it was on MLB Network. And it's like, Ichiro just seems like whenever he has to hit a home run, he hits it. And you're like, it's just inexplicable. Those guys, two guys, magic moment players, great players, Hall of Famers, obviously uh, figured that would be good guys to close out on. What do you have to say about them? Yeah, Ichiro's probably the best two-way player, best right fielder two-way player of our lifetime. Um, He knew how to get it done offensively and defensively, stayed around the league a while, obviously a Seattle legend, Um, and you can't say enough about that guy. Always went out there, did did the work, always hustled, was always a fan favorite, could hit for, obviously not the strongest power hitter, but was able to steal as well, got on base, and yeah, fantastic guy there, a lot of respect towards Ichiro. No, yeah, Ichiro, Ichiro is huge, and then, like I said, uh, Tony Gwynn's obviously a uh, all-timer, and both of them, I actually didn't realize they were actually a lot closer in home runs than I thought. Ichiro was 117, Tony was 135, so they were actually a lot closer um, than I thought, but both of those guys were all-timer hitters and uh, great guy to close the show um, on uh, highlighting, but I don't know if you had anything as a closing um, point to go off of uh, for our new installment going into the season, our first season installment of the Jetpacks to the Bank podcast. No, all I got is go Phillies. Let's start the season strong and beat these Marlins because you don't want to start bad there. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I have – Um, I obviously have what I said in our other podcast. Now that he's back, I think Wheels and all are going to combine to make a great duo at the top of the rotation – I think Spencer Howard will come in by the sixth game. That'll be great for us. And then, as Biscuit always says in our Chase Independent podcast, sign JT Real Muto. (laughs) Um, So this has been, for Joe Boric, uh, Andrew Santangelo, this has been the true Philadelphian sportscast. Jetpacks to the bank, first season installment as we're getting ready to kick off the Phillies season. Hopefully we make those playoffs. We should now with the expanded playoffs. Have a great and pleasant day, everybody. Peace out.